Good evening. My name is Lacey Ballinger. I'm Director of Collections and Exhibits at the Tallahassee Museum. Thank you for joining us for this most recent installment of our Museum Mixology Series, which is a virtual lecture series offered Thursdays at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And the purpose of this series is to provide a variety of unique happy hour experiences, including cocktails and crime, sipping with science, and a toast to history. Exclusively for our adult audience, um, it is a great night for couples, a nice place to meet up with friends, and is a fun experience learning about history, natural science, and wildlife. Uh, a virtual tip jar has been set up if you would like to uh, be generous and donate um, to our cause. Uh, we're incredibly grateful to your consistent demonstration of the value you see in us. And because of you, we are able to advance the cultural and educational impact of the museum. So that virtual tip jar is in the chat room. So if you want to go in the chat room and check it out, I would greatly appreciate it. And thank you for your continued support. And we look forward to seeing you every week. Uh, one of the things I enjoy most about this lecture series is hearing from researchers and scholars and about what they're currently working on and um, publishing on and um, also providing an opportunity for those speakers to share what they're working on um, which they don't get as often as we I would like. Um, in many ways I hope this series can be a catalyst for change um, whether it be on environmental issues or health issues um, or maybe in your life. Um, so tonight's speakers include Sydney Niles, Taylor Glatke, and Dr. Ryan Rogers. Chemistry graduate student Sydney Niles began her work in chemistry at the University of Michigan where she received a BS in chemistry in 2016. At Michigan she conducted research on aerosols which sparked her interest in environmental chemistry. She began her PhD in analytical chemistry with Dr. Alan Marshall and Dr. Ryan Rogers at Florida State University in 2016 where she used mass spectrometry at the National High Magnetic Field Laboratory, or MAGLAB as we know it locally, to study the molecular composition of petroleum. In 2017, her interest shifted to oil spill research in line with her passion for environmental chemistry as she began studying the effects of sunlight on the chemical composition of crude oil after a spill. Most notably, she and her collaborators found that petroleum and road asphalt can produce water-soluble toxins after being oxidized by sunlight in the environment. She hopes to defend her dissertation this November, um, congratulations, uh, and um, pursue her career in petroleum chemistry. Third year chemistry graduate student Taylor Glatke uh, completed her undergraduate studies at Spring Hill College in Mobile, Alabama, where she received a BS in chemistry. During her time at Spring Hill, Taylor conducted research on the identification of compounds in complex food mixture. She began her PhD in analytical chemistry at FSU under the mentorship of Dr. Alan Marshall and Dr. Ryan Rogers in the fall of 2018. She currently works at the MAG lab where she uses high resolution mass spectrometry to study the chemical composition and structure of crude oil and other fossil fuel based products. Recently, she has completed work that investigated how environmental weathering processes can transform crude oil after an oil spill. And the rest of her time at FSU, Taylor will continue to study how weathering processes after effect commonly used fossil fuel based products and the impacts this could have on the environmental public health. Ryan Patrick Rogers received his BS in chemistry from the University of Florida in 1995 and a PhD in analytical chemistry from Florida State University in 1999. Following a postdoctoral appointment at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, he joined the cyclotron res resonance program at the MAGLAB in 2001 as an assistant scholar scientist and a courtesy faculty member of the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry at FSU. He currently directs environmental, petrochemical, and forensic applications of FTICR mass spectrometry at the MAGLAB as a research faculty three, an FSU distinguished scholar, and as a past associate editor of Energy and Fuels. So I would like for you to welcome all of those speakers for me, and I will turn it over to you guys. I think Ryan's logging in. He should pop up. There he is. Yep. Great. Thank you so right. much, Ryan. No problem. Uh, I assume everyone can see the screen. I'm hoping so. I can yep. see it. Okay. Okay. Great. All right. Good evening. Um, 
Today, I'm going to talk to you about uh, the research of Taylor Glackey and uh, Sydney Niles, who are shown on the opening slide. And uh, we're going to be talking about some of the work uh, that was mentioned in the introduction in understanding the uh, behavior of petroleum materials in the environment. Um, so one of the major concerns is that uh, petroleum materials are part of our everyday world. Um, and a lot of them are legacy materials uh, that uh, were used uh, in the earlier days, late 1800s to 1900s, uh, because there was no other economic use for them. Um, and so uh, we want to understand how these materials age in the environment and uh, any pot potential uh, uh, health concerns from their use. And so this was motivated by a very simple uh, observation, uh, and that is on the left, you can see uh, freshly uh, paved asphalt road, uh, and on the right, you see what it looks like approximately seven to ten years later. And the simple question is, is, is what happened? Um, you go from a black, smooth road where you cannot see the aggregate or the rocks in it, and after time, you end up with a gray road where you can actually see uh, the rocks uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the asphalt surface. And so uh, we initially set out uh, to understand uh, what's going on here. First, we have to understand uh, what is the black uh, glue, goo uh, that glues everything together uh, to form an asphalt road. Uh, this is a very simple schematic of a distillation unit and a refinery. And so crude oil will be uh, injected in the bottom um, it's distilled, uh, so it's heated up, and the lights that come off the top um, are liquefied uh, petroleum uh, gas, um, which is uh, very similar to natural gas. And then comes off all your uh, usable fuels that you're familiar with, gasoline, jet fuel, diesel fuel, and other things. Uh, some of the heavier material that uh, has a higher boiling point uh, is not useful for fuels, and so they're actually sent to cracking units that break the molecules uh, and then put them back together uh, or modify them to create the fuels that we need. Uh, and this is what's done uh, in every modern refinery in the U.S. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, down here at the bottom, you, you have stuff that doesn't boil, uh, and that's pictured in the upper right up here. Uh, this is commonly called resid or residuum, uh, and it's used as an asphalt base. In other words, it's basically what's used uh, straight from the refinery um, to uh, create our asphalt roads. And why is this a concern? So I, I think the, the major motivation for the initial uh, research was just the sheer volume uh, that are used uh, in our country. And so in the US alone, uh, 300 million tons of this stuff uh, is laid down every year. Uh, most of it is recycled. Uh, so the gray roads that I showed earlier would be chewed up uh, in what's called reclaim at asphalt. And then it's recoated with black uh, asphalt binder and then it's laid back down uh, as road material. But three million tons per year find its way into uh, landfills. And of this 300 million tons, uh, four to eight percent of it, uh, so roughly 25 million tons, is the asphalt black binder. Um, it's also used other places in asphalt shingles, where 1.5 billion meters uh, of them are, are used, square meters. Uh, and those don't get recycled, so 11 million tons per year uh, get sent uh, to, to landfills. And the important distinction here at the beginning of, of this talk slash discussion is that these are petroleum derived materials. So what is this stuff? Uh, well, it's, it's the vacuum residuum, so it's what does not boil uh, in the processing of petroleum. And a common separation uh, or fractionation of this material is to generate asphaltines and maltines. And as you can imagine, the term asphalt comes from 
the high concentration of asphaltenes that are in this material. This is a simple solubility uh, uh, separation. What dissolves in uh, heptane, which is an organic solvent, is called maltines. Uh, what does not dissolve is called asphaltenes. Uh, and that, I know it sounds very simple, but that's 100 plus years of that's how it's been done. So each one of them contains waxes, which you may be familiar with, uh, aromatics, which we'll talk about in a second, and sulfur and nitrogen containing uh, organics. Uh, if you ever wondered why crude oil stinks, uh, that's the sulfur uh, that causes the smell. Uh, and both fractions contain relatively the same materials. It's just asphaltines contain more of these aromatics and more of these sulfur and nitrogen containing organic molecules and also higher molecular weight or heavier waxes. That's why they don't boil. And we're going to talk about the aromatics specifically uh, next. So aromatics are just a general term for this type structure in chemistry. Um, this is a single what's called an aromatic ring. Uh, it's, this is benzene. Um, just for reference, this will kill you. Uh, it is highly toxic. If you join multiple of these benzenes together on their sides, then you start to form multi-ring structures, and these are affectionately called polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, or PAHs for short. Uh, naphthalene you're familiar with, uh, that's the smell that comes from mothballs. Uh, some of the higher molecular weight ones you may not be familiar with, but these uh, uh, higher ring structures cause cancer and are uh, present in both uh, grilled foods and uh, cigarette smoke. So uh, it's, it's a concern over these type molecules, uh, which are known to be mutagenic and carcinogenic, uh, that is, is the concern. Uh, just for a quick note, uh, you know, the reason why you should never uh, let gasoline, kerosene, or other things touch your skin is because they're, they have a significant amount of benzene in them. So this gets back to the original question that we posed earlier. So this was a waste material. Uh, there, was, there was no cracking units or refineries that could make use of it uh, back then. And even now, it's, it's of limited uh, economic uh, use. So they started paving roads with it. And so the first asphalt road was paved in New, New, Jer New Jersey in 1870. And the understanding of exactly what's in here is, is still unknown today. And so it's a very simple question. Um, you know, this legacy commitment made 150 years ago uh, for something that was a waste material that's still being used today, is, is that a good idea? And uh, maybe we should understand any potential dangers uh, in that legacy commitment that was, that was made so long. And so in, in order to address that, uh, and admittedly this is going to be an odd detour, but uh, we're going to uh, revisit the, the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. And the reason we're going to do that is because seven years ago, uh, we were lucky enough to ob obtain grant money to understand how does these, these type residues form that wash ashore uh, after an oil spill. And the reason that the formation of these materials are so important is, well, not only uh, are they uh, not easy to clean up and obviously not what you want on a beach, uh, but the amount of these materials uh, from the Deepwater Horizon oil spill is, is higher than should be there. And so they're, they're forming from uh, other mechanisms that weren't really understood. Another question is, is that you have a brownish oil that's spilled into the Gulf of Mexico and as has been documented with other spills, uh, you get these orange and yellowish streaks uh, that form uh, on the surface. And this oil will go from a slick uh, to a matte. 
uh, down here, where it's, you actually get what's called affectionately a surface mousse. It's like mousse type material. So the question is how all this forms. And so I'll, I'll spare you, you know, seven years of research, but uh, basically it's sunlight. Uh, sunlight is the key to these materials and to their formation. And we're able to demonstrate that, isolate the materials and show that they were similar to what was observed uh, after the oil spills. And in relatively simple experiments, uh, you can create a surface slick in the lab uh, on top of seawater and irradiate it and get thick mousse type materials just like you see in the uh, environment. And we've analyzed the, the composition of these and they match almost perfectly. So we're very confident that we understand uh, how these are formed. Uh, you can actually do fun things like uh, mix the water very quickly and you can form what's affectionately called peanut butters. So these are very, very thick uh, mousses or emulsions. Uh, and you can see the difference of the dark sample that never saw light versus the one that did. So you, you have a large change in chemistry uh, due to sunlight. And Taylor, who's uh, been working on another aspect of this, has shown that you can generate these, you know, similar type colors and, and materials uh, from one type, maltines, and then you can actually generate uh, asphaltine type material. So you can have a complete change in a material solubility uh, due to changes in the molecules due to, to sunlight. And so we start to get a handle on, you know, how this is forming because it's being, uh, it interacts with sunlight and it and then with reaction with oxygen, it becomes oxygenated. But the, the underlying question was, okay, you know, how this stuff is forming is, is now pretty well understood, but why, why is this forming? And so that uh, was leveraged by almost 20 years of, of research in petroleum and other complex mixtures. And Again, to, to summarize a whole bunch of work, what we found out is there are two structural type motifs or types of structures in petroleum. And this is noteworthy because I showed you, this is a PAH, right? This is just a giant version of what I showed you before. Um, and they're all connected into what is affectionately called an island type structure. So you have one giant PAH and then you have essentially short wax type uh, sections hanging off. And this is again called an island motif, but the motif over here on the right uh, wasn't widely accepted to exist in petroleum. And we were one of the first to definitively prove that it does. And it's you know, relatively almost the same type structure, but instead of one giant PAH, it has smaller PAHs that are linked by short wax chains here. And so the concern uh, or the interest in this was how do each one of these uh, behave when you shine sunlight on them? Because we're trying to figure out how these things were formed and why they're forming in the environment. And so uh, a very talented uh, postdoc in our group figured out how to separate these two from petroleum. And so the experiment is simple, is now that you can separate these type island structures from the other ones, you can create a thin film on water uh, and then shine light on it. And what happens is you basically chop off uh, these wax, uh, like arms, and you're left with just the aromatic core, and that is tar. And so you take a nice film, you shine sunlight on it, and you end up with tar in the uh, bottom of the uh, beaker after 24, uh, a week of exposure to, to sunlight. And that was fantastic because that pretty much explained a lot of this material, where 
you have uh, photo modification of the oil to create these black sticky tars that were, were seen in the environment. Now, a really surprising thing uh, happened when we looked at the archipelago structures. And so we isolated them from the crude oil, put them on a thin film, and when we shine sunlight on them, uh, we get what's on the right. And so this, this was eye-opening. So what we have going on is we have sunlight is clipping these linkages between these PAHs that I showed you earlier. And so in, instead of one giant PAH being in the environment, which is not water soluble, right? You have the formation of small PAHs uh, that are water soluble. And so that immediately got us to thinking that, you know, if, if this type behavior is happening where you have sunlight putting energy in and the bonds cleaving to liberate these small pHs versus having one giant pH that's not water soluble, then you could potentially have uh, migration of these type compounds, uh, which again, you know, these core structures are known to be mutagenic and, and carcinogenic. So uh, there was a, a concern there, obviously. And so the simple progression of the research was, if these form from petroleum and asphalt binder is made from petroleum, does the asphalt binder in our roads behave similar, similarly? And so uh, we set out uh, to do those experiments to understand uh, if they do. So we're back. Uh, to our residue, our asphalt binder, which is mixed with the rocks and then rolled down to uh, create our roads. Uh, we have just the binder. And the simple question is, is if you shine sunlight on this, uh, what happens? Are, are these type structures in there that might be cleaved by the sunlight to essentially leach uh, material from the asphalt uh, into the surrounding environment. So the experiment again is is pretty simple. Uh, we have a glass slide uh, with the asphalt binder was applied to it and dried before it's put in the water and it's on a glass ring uh, and that allows a stir bar to essentially circulate the water uh, as the sunlight is shining on uh, the asphalt binder film. And again, uh, we're, we're testing the hypothesis that these molecules are, are in the binder and will be cleaved by the sunlight to liberate these uh, PAH uh, type molecules. And so when we did the experiment, um, we indeed see a change in the color of the water the asphalt film completely crumbles away from the, uh, the slide. So there's, a, again, a large change in the chemistry and behavior relative to the dark control, which is uh, didn't see any sunlight and it's just a asphalt film sitting underwater, sort of like a submerged asphalt road. Um, and so when you look at how much uh, material went into the water, um, you do that by uh, non-purgeable organic carbon uh, analysis. Uh, you see that the dark control has, you know, two parts per million um, of uh, carbon in the water, essentially nothing. It's, it's very low. Uh, after you irradiate it for 24, 72, and 168 hours, uh, you see that there's a 26-fold increase and the amount of organic material that's in the water. And so this was of, of concern because this establishes the potential of this asphalt binder to contribute to uh, the surrounding environment uh, in a uh, not so uh, nice way, chemically. 
And so the, the summary of the results are shown in the short cartoon where the sunlight breaks down the film, it starts to delaminate from the slide, and then starts to form these water-soluble compounds, uh, which then in the real world would be leached uh, from, the, uh, from the road. So, and we published this and uh, immediately got calls from lots of different asphalt uh, uh, organizations and uh, they weren't particularly happy with what we published, but we were just assessing the potential of this material to contribute to water soluble species in the surrounding environment. Uh, and then we got a phone call that, you know, frankly just kind of blew us all away. And the phone call was from this guy, uh, his name's Tom Ennis, and he's the lead of the watershed, watershed Protection Department in the city of Austin, Texas. And he says, hey, you know, we love the work, it's fantastic, but have you guys looked at coal-derived products in the asphalt industry? And as a petroleum chemist, for much of my career, I, I literally said, what? Um, I totally thought he was kidding. Um, and he said, he said, unfortunately, I'm not. And he pointed us to, to this, and that this is not used on public or federal roadways, but it is used and is allowed in the US on private property. And we were shocked when we heard this because coal derived products are PAHs, like completely almost 100% PAHs. Things that are known to cause cancer and be mutagenic. And so uh, we immediately said, well, <laughs> we, we definitely have to start looking at these materials as well. So we did some research and we were pointed to lots of bulletins that are released by the EPA, which warn you over and over again, you know, this stuff is 50% or more by weight PAHs. And they start warning you on its use on private property anywhere around storm drains or other water facilities. Uh, in a weird twist of, well, it's not really humor, but uh, it's a exemption by the EPA that what still allows this material to be used, uh, but they still love to put out uh, bulletins telling you to warning this is this is dangerous and that all these cities over here, which I'll discuss both of these, uh, Austin, Texas, and District of Columbia, have banned the sale of use of them in their cities, uh, districts, or in the case of Minnesota, uh, the entire state. And so this is what's striking. So in our area of research, uh, we measure the mass of molecules. And when they line up like this, this is the PAH line. It tells you anything right up against this line is a PAH. And that's what we get when we analyze a coal tar sealant used for asphalt. Uh, by our technology at the Magnet Lab, uh, it is PAH. It, it, it is a collection of different molecular weight or different size PAHs, but the whole damn sample is PAH. And so this is in striking uh, contrast to, you know, these are petroleum based, and you can see that they're offset from the line and uh, are, are much more diverse uh, in their molecular structures. And this basically summarizes I guess visually why we, we thought this was a joke, uh, that this was used. Because the 300 million tons of the asphalt binder material uh, over here, or asphalt type uh, petroleum derived sealant, that stuff we were worried about these molecules cracking to become one of these. But in the weird twist of fate, you know, we're worried about these molecules cracking to yield a PAH molecule that would be right on this line. But there, there's no cracking required. <laughs> this stuff is PAH. 
uh, the, the, almost the whole material. And so we, we sort of changed gears and said, okay, uh, this is insane uh, because you know, these essentially are PAHs, which are known to be carcinogenic and mutagenic. But the question is, is do these materials have the potential to be modified by sunlight and unfortunately become water soluble and migrate off of the parking lot or whatever uh, facility that is using uh, these type materials? So the question was, was that, okay, we, this is a little crazy. You know, all, all the, a lot of these are known to be carcinogenic and mutagenic, and they're allowed to be sprayed on private property on asphalt surfaces to seal them um, every day uh, in a lot of the Eastern United States. But can these molecules form water solubles that, that would be a problem as well? Uh, and the short answer is yes, they do. And so we compared uh, an asphalt. So this is a petroleum derived material. So this is very similar to what uh, we talked about before, is where you apply a thin film on a glass slide and you set it on top of a ring and then you have your stir bar in the bottom and you shine sunlight on it. But these asphalt sealants are very low, 50 ppm. Uh, PAHs. And so you can see that, you know, the amount of colored uh, water is, is very low. So the, it, it is in stark contrast to the, to the coal derived. So this is the coal derived sealant. Um, and this is the water that's formed it. And just for reference, this petroleum based asphalt sealant compared to the coal tar sealant there's a thousand times higher concentration of PAHs, and these are the things that are known to kill you or cause cancer, uh, in the material before it's ever exposed to sunlight. So this is just how bad it is before they even spray it on the parking lot. And so when you look at the water solubles that are formed, remember, you know, this is the PAH line. So the closer you get to it, the worse you are. And the petroleum materials, yeah, some of it is, is close to the pH line, but a lot of the species that we detect are far away from the line. And so again, the concern would be that over extended uh, time in the sunlight, one of these may crack and come over to get close to this line, but uh, we, we do have some concerning behavior, but it is nothing compared to what we see from the uh, coal derived material. And remember, the closer you get to this line, uh, at least in the chemistry world, the, the much greater concern that you have for adverse uh, health effects for exposure. And so uh, this was taken from a presentation uh, given by uh, the District of Columbia. And this is what sparked their ban. Uh, is that they actually found a coal tar sealed parking lot right next to a playground, uh, a daycare facility for kids. And how big of a concern this is, I think is shown by the picture on the right, where in a summer day, when it's nice and hot outside, if you walk over and just simply put your hand down on the ground, and then put your hand underneath a black light, all of this material that is glowing are PAHs. So the material will, will come off just with contact with skin. And so this is a huge concern. And as a petroleum chemist, uh, this took a little bit of uh, convincing from Tom that this is, this is actually what happens in this country. So. There's also a lot of a much larger concern is that not only with you know, contact with the skin, but these coal tar sealants have to be reapplied, you know, say every five or so years uh, to quote unquote maintain the film over the underlying uh, asphalt. 
but as it ages, it chips away from the surface. And that's why you have to reapply it. Well, those little chips, which are basically pure PAH uh, containing materials, uh, they stick to dirt. Uh, and you know, if it rains in this parking lot, it comes down here, washes the sediment over the thing, and then out it goes. And so the question is, is where does it go after it comes out here? Well, it goes into your retention ponds, which if you live in the state of Florida, you know all about uh, because they're everywhere. So you have a parking lot and based on the square footage of the parking lot, you have to have a certain size catchment um, for the water. So the water, if this is a coal tar sealed uh, parking lot, then as it ages, uh, the flakes are washed down uh, the, the uh, spillway uh, into uh, the sediment catch basin. And then they accumulate here. So as this thing ages and ages and washes and washes, then all of the tiny chips that were up here are now sitting uh, in your, uh, your catchment. And so what, well, what's the problem with that? Well, I mean, the problem with that is that, you know, as this material ages uh, and starts to release water solubles, then those are going, uh, of course, out of the catchment and into rivers, streams, and ponds, and other things like that. But the annual year-over-year -year accumulation of potentially multiple sources of this material uh, can cause some major problems. And those problems have been encountered by basically the state of Minnesota and Austin and Austin, Texas and the DC area. And the, the simple reason that they're having these difficulties uh, is because they actually measure the PAH content of these catchment sediments. So if you never did the measurement, you, you really know how, you would have no idea that you basically had uh, a toxic, uh, toxic waste sitting in your, uh, in your catchment. Uh, and the problem is, is that these catchments, they start to fill up with sediment. And so you say, okay, well, after seven years, I have to come in here with a backhoe or in some dump trucks, and I have to get all the sediment out so it can hold more water. Well, in Austin, Texas, you have to test the soil uh, to make sure it doesn't contain any contaminants. Uh, and when they did, you know, the threshold is roughly, this is the, uh, the exposure threshold uh, where you start to see effects is 22.8 ppm essentially. And this was the pH content of the stream sediments. And so they're off, I mean, off the chart. So they're 100 times, 150 times higher than what's, this is what happens when you start to see effects on the environment, on the wildlife, on the crayfish and other things like that. And so, uh, this became a massive problem uh, in Minnesota because if you're above this limit, then the sediment in the catchment uh, is essentially hazardous waste. And so when you would normally go to this thing and the contractor says, okay, for 25 grand, I'll dig out everything, put it in a dump truck, and then we'll head to the landfill and we'll get rid of it or use it as fill or whatever else. That's if you're below this limit or what's ever defined by your state. If you're over that limit, then all of this sediment is hazardous waste. And it has to go to a special landfill. It can't be used for backfill or other purposes. And that increases the cost from like 20 to 25 grand up to 200 to 250 grand. And so this was a huge problem for the state of Minnesota because they're basically going to go bankrupt uh, trying to uh, responsibly dispose of 
their catchment sediments uh, for the sole reason uh, that was tied back to the use of, of coal tar uh, derived sealants on private property. And so what happens if you start to get to levels above this? Uh, that was documented um, in the DC area. And when you start getting above these limits, 66% uh, of all of the catfish uh, in this waterway had, because they're down at the bottom uh, near the sediment as it, as it settles, 66% uh, of them had uh, either liver or skin lesions. These are tumors uh, that are growing on the fish uh, and linked to the, uh, the toxicity of these PAHs that are, that are bleeding off from these uh, coal tar derived uh, materials. And so they're, they're still legal. Uh, they're still used in the US and, and because there are asphalt alternatives or petroleum based alternatives with a thousand times less uh, of these harmful PAHs in them, uh, I, I can't really explain why they're, why they're still legal. So that was a little tour of, of how we went from understanding what happened in the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, uh, understanding what structure causes uh, this uh, type behavior, and then moving to uh, petroleum derived asphalt materials, uh, ultimately to, uh, to coal tar derived materials, uh, and being concerned about their environmental effects and all tied to these multi-ring species uh, known as uh, PAHs. So the, the take home message is, is that petroleum based materials do have pHs in them, but they are nowhere near coal derived materials. And so these materials do or have the potential uh, to crack and form uh, water soluble species. Uh, we've seen these, we've, we've characterized them, and now we're starting a collaboration with uh, uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, to, to do toxicity tests on these uh, and uh, exposing these to human cell lines uh, to understand how the human uh, cells react to these types of water soluble compounds. But again, uh, these materials are, are low, relatively low in pHs. The concern is, is that bigger molecules can crack and form pHs that become water soluble that could be a concern. That is in complete contrast uh, with uh, these coal tar uh, emulsions. They're basically uh, PAHs, which are largely water insoluble, mixed with a detergent so that they will mix with water. Uh, and then you spread them on the, the asphalt and the water evaporates and you're left with uh, the black skin that we've been talking about. So it does form water solubles. Uh, they are very close to the characteristic pH line uh, that we uh, can detect and characterize in the instruments at the magnet lab. So these are of serious concern uh, for potential health effects. But you know, in the weird twist of the research, um, you don't even need sun. If, if just the coal tar itself, if it flakes off, um, it, it's known to be mutagenic and carcinogenic, and uh, it's, it's roughly a, a thousand times uh, higher in these, uh, these molecules than, than petroleum-based uh, sealants or uh, asphalt binder. And so with that, uh, I'll close and of course be open for, to any uh, questions, but uh, I'd like to thank NSF, of course, in the state of Florida for uh, Magnet Lab funding, uh, Gulf of Mexico from the, this is the BP oil spill uh, research initiative. Uh, and then others that, like I mentioned, the stuff from DC uh, and city of Austin, uh, for providing slides and also contributions from Clean Wisconsin who uh, are starting to ban these materials and they're 
uh, cities and state as well, and the Chesapeake Bay program. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Rogers. Would you talk a little bit about your background and what made you get interested in petroleum chemistry and or is it always petroleum chemistry or did you start in a different area? Um, so when I was a undergrad at University of Florida, I worked for a fantastic uh, professor there named Sam Colgate. Uh, and he was doing, uh, uh, I don't I mean, hydrate research. I don't know if people are familiar with it, but if you remember when they tried to put the dome over the, uh, the Macondo well, when it was leaking, mm -hmm. they, they had this big dome and they tried to put it on top and they showed this white, uh, like ice forming that clogged it up and it didn't work. Uh, those were hydrates. So they're, they're actually water cages that form around natural gas. Uh, well, I studied that with Dr. Colgate when I was an undergrad. And so petroleum had always been an interest to me. And then when I came to the Magnet Lab, uh, they knew of my work at an undergrad. And so I was given a petroleum project actually to build a mass spectrometer uh, as, a, as a graduate student. And so it's, I can argue it's been downhill ever since then. <laughs> That's impressive. <laughs> Um, does anybody have any questions? You can post them in the chat room or in the Q&A box or raise your hand. I am watching you, uh, watching those avenues. And Sydney and Taylor are here as well. So if anybody has questions for them, mm -hmm. absolutely. Oh, Diane in Norway would like to know, are commercial parking lots allowed to use the coal base sealer? Uh, in the state of Florida, uh, actually in largely the entire eastern U.S., they are. Mm. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's I mean, it literally, uh, it was a twilight zone moment for me uh, as a petroleum chemist that coal-derived materials would ever be allowed to be used in that type of application. Um, I mean, it's really chemical insanity, in, in my opinion. So um, they are allowed. Um, there are certain uh, rather large businesses in Florida that that have parking lots that are that are paved in this and, and covered in this stuff. Uh, so the the real key is that you have to, if you have tight control and management of the sediments before they're removed, then I think this will fix itself really quickly. Mm -hmm. Because when you start telling someone that the cost to dig their catchment out went up from 20 grand to 200 grand, uh, you're going to get people's attention really quick. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what happened in Minnesota. So I think tight uh, monitoring and, and management of and testing of these catchment sediments uh, is something that, that should be done and pushed forward. Mm -hmm. So Diana followed up with that. So our local big box stores are essentially polluting our lakes and water resources. If they're using coal derived materials to seal their parking lots, they are. Now, you know, in west of the Rockies, um, I, I don't wanna say they have tighter or more vigorous uh, testing, but they've largely moved away from these materials a decade ago. They're actually banned in Europe. I mean, you can't even sell them um, or use them anywhere. Uh, but the Western US has, has largely moved to petroleum derived materials. But yeah, the, if, you, if you wanna get your asphalt driveway in Massachusetts resealed for before winter, uh, you you can you can get it sprayed with coal derived materials or you can get it sprayed with asphalt. And are the, is the EPA not addressing this in any way, or is it just uh, too too early to? No, actually, you know, this has been going on for for more than fifteen years, twenty mm -hmm. years, and so 
yeah, I mean, so I mean, you can imagine uh, you have some pretty angry cities and and states uh, because uh, th this stuff is allowed to be sold, and they they assume it's it's a safe material. Right. Uh, and, and then you start testing your soil before you dispose of it from your city catchments or your private catchments, and you it's basically hazardous waste mm -hmm. uh, because of the pH content. So. I think it's 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 odd. So when I looked into this, you know, it's the EPA has published, you know, bulletins on essentially warnings about using these materials. But from what I understand, it's an EPA exemption that allows them to be sold. That's crazy. And <laughs> yeah, it's even even crazier than that is that the EPA is also responsible for classifying diesel exhaust, which is PAHs, as a carcinogen. And that's why we have to have all these, you know, expensive exhaust systems put on diesel vehicles. Right. And yet they'll allow you to coat your driveway With in essentially stuff. diesel exhaust. Hmm. It's, yeah, it's, 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 that's why I said twilight zone. I mean, I was like, mm -hmm. you've got to be kidding me. Mm -hmm. Okay, it looks like Bob's got his hand up. Um, Bob, you want to? Sure. Unmute yourself, Bob. Could could you talk a bit about the work that's being done at MIT? Is that looking at 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 solubles from coal tar or asphalt or what 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 is that research up there? Sure. So uh, uh, MIT uh, has. Uh, some pretty spectacular facilities and cell lines uh, where they can take the water solubles that are generated from uh, petroleum asphalt binder, petroleum asphalt sealants, as well as coal tar. They take the water solubles, they expose the human cell lines uh, to these materials, and they quantify and characterize DNA damage. Uh, which would be carcinogenic, mutagenic type things, but they also uh, monitor disruptions in cellular signaling pathways. So they they monitor essentially how the cells are chemically reacting to uh, the contaminants. Uh, thank you. Yep. Okay, Shauna has a question. What materials are used in paved walkways? and around holding ponds. Um, uh, Sean, are you talking about concrete or are you talking about asphalt material, type material? Yeah, so I mean, most of these materials, you know, if, if it's dark colored or black, um, yeah. it's going to be either petroleum based or coal based. If it's on a public, like a state, county or federal road it it's 99 plus percent likely that it's it has to be petroleum derived it's on big box you know parking lots on uh another source of this is the large uh planned communities in south florida that's all private property so if they want to seal However many miles of, of asphalt road they have out there with coal tar, uh, they can. Uh, David says it sounds like another Silent Spring issue. <laughs> it's, well, I mean, I, I've sort of pushed this, uh, you know, I, I'm very good friends with the professor at MIT that's, that we're, we're starting to work with. Uh, because it it truly was a twilight zone moment when Tom called me and he said, you know, I love the petroleum work. That's fantastic. You know, now that you can, you have the instruments at the magnet lab to look at all of these, not the original molecules, but the molecules that are modified by sunlight and become water soluble because obviously they weren't water soluble before, but he's like, man, you should look at coal derived. And I, I, Honest to God, I thought it was a joke. Mm -hmm. So how much of your time now is spent being an activist? 
Oh, almost zero. <laughs> no. I, I mean, I, uh, Tom is, is, is sort of egging me on um, to get more involved in this stuff. Uh, he runs a website called uh, Coal Tar Free America. Uh, if you ever want to have a, I don't know, kind of a, a sick laugh uh, about how crazy this stuff is. He's, he's got a pretty entertaining website, but uh, I did just uh, interact with uh, a resident in a large planned community uh, in the Palm Beach area who I basically wrote a summary of how insane it is to use these materials and the, the board reversed their decision and went from coal tar to asphalt based sealants. Mm -hmm. So I, I tried when I can. Absolutely. Well, I've learned a lot. I mean, I mean, we're talking about doing paving at the museum and um, hoping we're not going to be doing anything like that. <laughs> no, just make sure it's, yeah, you don't want, you don't want ethylene cracked residue, which mm -hmm. is EPR, and you don't want coal tar. Okay. Uh, you just want asphalt-based sealants. Okay. So, and it's oh, sure. you know, the frustrating thing is, is that there is a uh, cost-competitive uh, material, which is the asphalt, mm -hmm. uh, which is, you know, we're we're going to test uh, the the water-soluble materials from from petroleum-derived asphalt, but just from initial glance i mean there's it's night and day difference between the molecules that are formed um so it's it's by far the safest bet in my opinion mm -hmm. i'm not seeing any more questions you guys are kind of quiet tonight That's it's been a stressful week <laughs> there's been a lot this week and it's gonna be a lot for a while i think yeah. <laughs> Uh, Sean, I'd like to know how you can find about products uh, that have already been laid. Um, I think they have to do a, uh, most of the time, the, at least the planned communities will have these, uh, I think they're made public, they're the, the, the tenders for bids for, for, uh, for the work. I don't know if it's all permitted, mm -hmm. but... Uh, you can, a lot of times, if it is permitted or in a, a tender offer for bid for the job, they'll specifically, they'll have to specify if it's a coal tar or ethylene cracked residue material versus a, an, a, a petroleum based material. Okay. And, you know, it's, it's frustrating because these, these companies are, are, in my opinion, a bit devious because when they first outlaw log coal derived, then they bought something called ethylene cracker residue, which chemically is, a, is the same thing, but it doesn't come from coal. So, so they just started laying that down. And then the state of Texas said, no, 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 no. You know, this is the same stuff. So, you know, it's, it's, it's as a chemist, it's just a little frustrating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, David makes a good point. He says that he's dumbfounded that it's still allowed. And as a building contractor, this kind of liability is beyond scary. Yeah, so um, I don't, I'm not crazy enough to think that uh, a chemist uh, or a collection of chemists can convince the public that this shouldn't be done. But th the way you really get their attention and we, we talked to the, the director or the coordinator for all of the catch basins in Minnesota. And he said, boy, when they started coming back with the contractor bids to dispose of their catchment sediment, the state outlawed it in record, record time because it was going to bankrupt Minnesota. Mm -hmm. you know, they have lakes and, and, you know, and these catchment basins all over the place. And that, you know, if you follow the rules and you do this testing before you dispose of any of that sediment in landfills or anywhere else, when you start getting those numbers that are 50, 100, 200 times what's allowed, uh, 
the bill is going to go up by a factor of 10 and that's that's going to get people's attention the, the, what i don't know is and i i'm trying to find out is do these catch basins have to be routinely tested if they're on private land mm -hmm. yeah so i sure hope they they have to be because i would hope so too Well, I'm not seeing any more questions. All right. So thank you so much for sharing all of this. I think we've all become uh, activists now and we'll start, uh, hopefully we have. And um, I, like I said, I learned a lot and I'm now uh, making sure that we're using the correct pro uh, substances at the museum. Um, and I, again, want to thank you all three for being here. Um, I know. It was a little stressful to get here, but um, we appreciate it greatly. And uh, we are hopefully having a lecture next week. Um, my speaker kind of dropped off the uh, planet for a few days and I haven't been able to get a hold of him. So um, I have it planned for next week. We'll be talking about um, slave ships um, and our speakers from the Mel Fisher Museum. So um, it should be very entertaining and um, interesting. And again, thank you all so much for being here and joining our uh, series. And we hope to see you next week. Um, but please stay safe out there, stay healthy, and have a good one. Thank good night, you. everybody. Yeah, good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.